from the revolutionary observations of Galileo in the 17th century to awe-inspiring advancements of James Webb's telescope in 21st century, the journey of human exploration and understanding of the cosmos has been an extraordinary odyssey. Over the centuries, astronomers, scientists, and engineers have relentlessly pushed the boundaries of technology and knowledge, transforming our perception of the universe. This captivating journey takes us from the humble beginnings of Galileo's telescope to the cutting edge capabilities of James Webb Space Telescope, showcasing remarkable innovation in the quest to unravel the mysteries of the universe. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to all of you. I, Dr. Shivani Vedi, feel dis delighted to welcome everyone present here on behalf of Research Cell of DAV College, Chandigarh, in association with Chandigarh Vigyan Parishad and Society for Promotion of Science and Technology for a talk on From Galileo to James Webb Space Telescope by Professor Ajit Kembabi. We are highly grateful to all the dignitaries for sparing their valuable time for today's event. I request our worthy principal, Professor Rita Jain, to kindly welcome Professor Ajit Kembavi by presenting him a token of our appreciation. May I also request Dean Research, DAV College, Dr. Munan Arang, Dr. Harmunish Taneja from Chandigarh Vigyan Parishad, and Sri Dharamveer Ji, President, SPSTI, to join Professor Rita Jain in front of the stage for felicitation. Thank you so much, everyone. Now I request Professor Rita Jain to welcome our guests and address the audience briefly. A very good morning, everyone. I extend a warm welcome to all of you on behalf of the entire DAV fraternity. I would like to express my sincere thanks to Shri Dharam Vinci, President of the Society for the Promotion of Science and Technology in India, and Professor S. P. Thomas, President Chandigarh Vigyan Parishad for granting DAV College the privilege of hosting this enlightening event. I would also like to offer my heartiest congratulations to Dr. Mona Naran, Dean Research Cell of DAV College and her team for the tireless efforts in organizing this event. My profound thanks go to Professor Ajit Kembhavi, our distinguished keynote speaker for generously devoting his valuable time to our students. I am confident that today's talk will be both captivating and enlightening for everyone in the audience. I also welcome and thanks to our principal, KSRS sir, who has been my first principal of this college, my mentor, my guide. I have learned a lot from him always. Thank you, sir, for coming. I also extend a warm welcome to Professor Arun Grover, Ex-Vice Chancellor of Punjab University, Chandigarh, Professor K. R. Dharamveer, ma'am, for joining us today. Furthermore, I am pleased to note that a significant number of scientists working on the Aditya L1 mission and affiliated with IUCA and have benefited from such guidance. On this occasion, I extend my best wishes to all of you for a joyful Engineers Day celebration. Let's relish the forthcoming discussion. Thank you and welcome you once again. Thank you, ma'am. Most of you must be aware that September 15 is also celebrated as Engineers Day. 
to briefly orient us about this we have amongst us a student of msc maths mansi can we have you on stage mansi good morning to all the teachers the respected teachers and students what if i told you that the first engineer was not a human but a bird yes a study by researchers from oxford university and university of vienna show that the new caledonian crow is the only crow that can make tools like hooks and props to extract food from hard to reach places it's interesting right engineers are innovative innovators who design build and maintain the system and structures that make our life easy and comfortable today i would like to appreciate the role of engineers in creating innovative solutions for the challenges of sustainable development september 15 which is celebrated as engineers day but why september 15 well it may marks the birth anniversary of sir mokshigundam vishweshwarya who is the who is widely regarded as father of engineering in bharat he was an exceptional engineer and scholar he was born on 15 september 1861 in small village of karnataka sir m vishweshwarya was inspired to become an engineer by his passion for learning and his love for maths and science he was influenced by progressive thinkers and leaders of time and wanted to use his engineering skills to serve the nation he made significant contribution to the field of irrigation flood control water supply and power generation he was also the chief architect of krishna raj sagar dam which is one of the largest reservoirs in asia he was awarded bharat ratna the highest civilian honor in bharat in 1955 for his services to nation he was also the 19th diwan of mysore and played a key role in economic and social progress of the state sir was not only an engineer but also an innovator and a leader he believed that engineering is not a profession but a way of life he said to give real service you must add something which can't be bought for what for money now coming to the theme of engineers day 2023 it is celebrating innovations and sustainability the theme aims to highlight critical role of the engineers play in addressing global challenges such as climate change and resource depletion on this occasion let us pay tribute to sir m vishweshwarya and all the engineers who have made remarkable achievements in various fields of engineering and also look forward to future with advancement in technology such as ai and robotics the field of engineering is set to revolutionize our world in a way we can't even imagine yet thank you so much happy engineers day everyone thank you mansi for providing us this useful information now i request professor kia dharmveer to kindly come on stage to orient our audience briefly about spsti and chandigarh vigyan parishad and introduce the speaker for today's session professor ajit kambari to our audience thank you let me begin with thanking you for having us here in the first place so first thanks to dr uh, jain principal for providing us with the venue and let me also mention here that we are holding this lecture in association with vigyan bharti and our other collaborators for this event are the science academies chandigarh chapter we have with us the inyas indian national young academy of science generally when i talk about academies i crack a joke here but then you are senior students so i expect you to know what science academies are they are not the academies that do coaching so it is an honor to be a member of an academy to member of a science academy and there are also arts academies sangeet natak academies ka naam aapne suna hoga so 
we have all the members of these elevated science academies who associate with us in organizing these lectures. Today's lecture in particular is being hosted by Vibha Vigyan Bharti. And the Chandigarh chapter of Vibha is known as Chandigarh Vigyan Parishad. Many of us here, especially myself, president of uh, SPSTI, Mr. Dharamveer, I'm sure Professor Arun Grover also, we are all life members of Chandigarh Vigyan Parishad. Our aims are completely aligned with the aims of Vibha, that is dissemination of science with Indian values and national objectives. So we are there also to uphold these values about very briefly about Society for Promotion of Science and Technology in India. It is an NGO, which is about 12, now 13 years old. And we work for popularization of science and technology. Uh, in this regard, we have visited your college a number of times, and we hope to continue working with you. We hold lectures like this. Uh, we have a mobile science lab with undergraduate level experiments. We take it from village to village to demonstrate experiments. We hold summer schools, we hold quizzes and many other science related activities. With that, let us come to today's speaker, Professor Ajit Kemgubi. We are honored to have you here, Professor Ajit. Uh, Professor Kembavi is an eminent astronomer. He is one of the founder members of Ayuka, Inter-University Center of Astronomy and Astrophysics. And at the end of his lecture, I hope some of you ask He has played a major role in setting up Ayuka and developed it into a world-class institute. Professor Kembavi works on galaxies, quasars, and other extragalactic objects. He also works on the application of AI, artificial intelligence, to astronomy. Computer scientists, scientists nahi hai, shayad honge. Magar AI ka istamal khub karte hai, aur ye bhi aap loong ko poonchna chahiye ki vibhin kshetro mein ye kaise use hota hai. Ligo, Ligo India, he's one of the persons who's pushing that project. He was vice president of the International Astronomical Union and former president of Astronomical Society of India. And he serves on ISRO's Apex Science Board. Okay, so with that, let me invite Professor Kim Bhavi to deliver his lecture. Uh, the students can come on the front because the screen is small. You will not be able to see uh, the presentation from that far. So you, as far as you can come forward, I request all of you to come forward. Is it possible to go out to me? Uh, yeah, just, just these two. Sure. Because there are a lot of questions. And I just want somebody can help me to put this on. U.S. people have it. Yeah.
और ये ये आप हाँ मैं यही होगा मगर थोड़ा थोड़ा बुक कर So good morning. Namaste. Good morning. I am uh, very grateful to DAV College for inviting me. Here and for SPSTI. Uh, I, I first went to a DAV college when I was about 17 years old. But the DAV college was in Sholapur, and I got there to give a debate. And since then, I've been hearing about this uh, institution. I must also, uh, first of all, apologize to members of SPSTI who are here, uh, because for them, this has become a double geo party, because I already gave them. Yeah. Yeah. So, because I already gave them quite a similar lecture. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I gave them quite a similar lecture. Uh, sometime I believe it was in January on the on the JWST, that's the James Webb Space Telescope, and then they asked me to repeat it here. To a live audience, that was of course a completely different experience. So uh, I want to begin with, rather than just parachute into the space telescope, I'll begin with the history of telescopes and how uh, emergent technology makes completely new science possible. And there are always two schools of thought which say that one says that we can work with paper and pencil, and then we can work with lab equipment and do very great science, which is completely true. But also great science is possible uh, using the greatest telescopes which are present uh, because uh, with the greatest telescope, you can see much further and much fainter uh, than other telescopes can see. So, uh, but what do you mean by greatest telescope? Uh, does it have to be as big as this building or does it have to be, does it have to be, it, can it be a small telescope? So I will begin with the biggest telescope in the world in the year 1609, uh, which was used by uh, Galileo. Uh, right, so you must all have uh, heard about Galileo, and he's a familiar name in the science. If you can put up these two rows of lights, it'll help very much. So I'm sorry about the small screen because the images are very important. So it's up, uh, but we'll try. Uh, uh, so you see that uh, Galileo, Galileo did not invent the telescope. He actually, it had been done by, by other people, and he simply used the telescope for the first time to do astronomical observations. The diameter of the lens, that is the most important parameter, the diameter of the lens and the diameter of the mirror, because that tells you how much light can be collected. Now, uh, Galileo's telescope had a diameter of only one inch. I've actually seen this telescope uh, in the city of uh, 
in a, <coughs> he said he was the, 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 the leading power, uh, leading tower of Pisa is that was in Pisa, uh, but the telescope itself now in Padua, and I've seen it there. And then uh, <coughs> what Galileo found was quite extraordinary because you must understand that until then, people had only worked with their naked eyes. And then when Galileo started his observations with the telescope, the first thing he did was to turn the telescope to the sun. You can't look at the telescope through the sun because you'll be blinded immediately, but he put an image on the wall. And then he found, amazingly, that the beautiful disk of the sun was marred by these dark spots. Now, this, of course, is a modern picture of the sunspots about which you all heard, but Galileo couldn't make these pictures. He had no camera. But you just look at the diagram from his book um, on, on these sunspots, and you see how similar to the modern sunspots that we observe. Now, this was an extremely important observation because, first of all, it established that the sun was not perfect. What was the nature of the spot, he did not know. Until then, the theologians held that the sun is a perfect object. It can have no imperfections. Right, so now, here is another picture from Galileo's notebook. And then, uh, you may not be able to see this from a distance, but there's an object here, which is actually the planet Jupiter, which we can very clearly see with the naked eye. But what we can't see with the naked eye are these four dots that you have got here. And it turns out that when you look at it with a modern telescope, very small modern telescope, you see that these four objects, which are satellites, they are the moons of Jupiter, which are going around it. And these are known as the Galilean moons, because many more moons have been found. But these four, Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, they're orbiting, they're, they're extremely beautiful objects, and they're orbiting Jupiter. So which again uh, destroyed the expectation that absolutely everything in the sky must be orbiting the Earth. So people did like that. They were not, some people were fascinated by these observations, but other people did like them and they caused a lot of trouble for Galileo. But probably for me, the most beautiful observation of Galileo is this particular object that you see there. And if I ask you what it is, you'll say that it is the moon, the half moon. But actually, it is the planet Venus. The planet Venus is a very, very bright planet. You can see it either early in the morning or early in the evening. Um, for, for some time, it is early in the morning. Sometimes it's there early in the evening. And then uh, Galileo, when he looked at it with the telescope, he found that it has got phases of the moon. So you see that uh, the Venus. And this is not Galileo's picture. It is a picture that we have taken with a modern telescope. And you see that there are phases of the moon. So here, the moon is like a crescent, but it is, it's a very, it's a quite a large object. And here it is nearly full, but it's a much smaller object. And then look at Galileo diagram, exactly <clears throat> like that. Now the important thing is that this allows you to argue that the sun and the moon and Venus cannot go around the earth, that moon and uh, the planet earth and uh, Venus would both be going around the sun. So, which is known as a heliocentric theory. I cannot uh, give the argument here because it will take too much time, but it was a remarkably beautiful uh, argument. So, Galileo was a great astronomer, but he was also a great physicist. What he did was that he, uh, he uh, talked about the principle of inertia, which later became uh, uh, important for the special theory of relativity, which Einstein invented. And then he also gave the principle of equivalence, Rigobata all heard about it, that he went on to the Tower of Pisa and dropped a heavy object, a light object, and both fell at the same time to the Earth, which is now known as the principle of equivalence by Einstein. And Einstein used this principle in general theory of relativity. So he was a great man, great physicist, great astronomer. But how did he make his living? Dr. Kia mentioned that academies are not uh, tuition classes. So Galileo had to make his uh, living by, by helping... Uh, armies to design their projectiles and guns, number one. And number two, he also had to do tuitions to make his living. Okay, so, so there are people who had to do all sorts of things for the love of science okay, from time in memory. Right, so now, uh, when we observe in the modern times, uh, you see that we were aware of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So you know that there's a wavelength, there's a frequency that you have for the spectrum, for, for photons or for the electromagnetic waves depending on how you want to look at it. And then uh, 
at the very lowest end of energy, which means the highest frequency and the smallest wavelength, you've got the radio waves. And then as you move towards the higher part, the higher frequencies, you get microwave, infrared radiation, then the optical, where our eyes are sensitive, and then ultraviolet X-rays and gamma rays. So now in modern astronomy, you look, you can observe an object in all these things. We look at the sun with our eyes, but it emits infrared and ultraviolet. But it emits everywhere in the electromagnetic spectrum. But there, in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, the, the proportionate emission by the sun is much small. But there are objects which can emit in the X-rays, in the gamma rays, as much as they emit in the optical. Right, so you look at this uh, beautiful object, which is called a crab nebula, and many of you may have seen a picture of it. And you see here that it is observed with different telescopes, right from radio to gamma rays. And you need to combine all this information together to get a proper idea of the physics of that object. And then that is known as multivalent astronomy. But from 2015 onwards, when we made the first detection of gravitational waves, okay, so then we have got a new kind of astronomy added to the uh, usual profile of astronomers, and that is known as multi-messenger astronomy, which is electromagnetic waves and uh, gravitational waves. So you will agree with me that you need special telescope to observe at different wavelengths. The radio telescope is not the same as optical telescope. But can we observe everything from the ground? It turns out that you can't. Because of the fact that, if we just look at this picture on the top, so just tell you how what fraction of the light is absorbed by our atmosphere. So you see that mercifully in the optical domain, the, the absorption is very little. And which is why we can see the outside universe. Otherwise it would be like having just, as if the, Earth were blanketed by clouds. You wouldn't have been able to see anything at all. But if you look at this part of the electromagnetic spectrum, you can't see, you can't observe that. You can't observe this part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So then how do you do that? In the old days, people used to use balloons. For example, TIFR had a, a great balloon facility. But nowadays, you do it maybe through satellites. So you put a telescope on a satellite, and then you send it out into space. And there, like, like we are sending Aditya L1, that has got telescope for observing the sun. Okay, and it is not going to be orbiting the Earth, it is going to be orbiting the L1 point of, which is between the Earth, uh, which, is, which is between the Earth and the sun. So nowadays, everybody is familiar with L1, but until this whole publicity started, hardly anybody had heard about the L1 at all. And also like to inform you that there are five of these. It doesn't stop at L1. L1, L2, L3, L4, and L5. So I'm going to be talking about L2 also today. Right, so now just, this is just a, uh, to make you aware and what are the best astronomical facilities in India now. We have a number of optical telescopes, but they're all relatively small. Uh, but then we have got this uh, observatory called, uh, oh, this is the old slide. Observatory called Astrosat, okay, which uh, which is in, which has been in orbit since 2016, and then uh, then uh, it observes at X-rays, at optical wavelengths, at ultraviolet wavelengths, and it has done absolutely splendid work. Then we have got the GMRT, uh, the Giant Peter Wave Radio Telescope, uh, and then there's the Aditya L1. So I this was launched on 2nd of September, on the 1st of September I was giving a talk in Calcutta, and I said tomorrow. So I forgot to change it. It actually was sent out in, on September 2nd. Then you've got this very big 30 meter telescope called the 30, uh, TMT. And then this is a LIGO. And this is a very giant uh, radio telescope called the Square Kilometer Array. So India is a partner in all these three projects and it is making very valuable contributions to them. So this will take a fair amount of time to get ready. And so, when the youngest people in the audience will be doing their PhD or postdoctoral work, they'll be working using these telescopes. Right, so now uh, we saw about Galileo's telescope. Now I just jumped to a very famous telescope. At least it used to be famous when I was in school and college. It is known as a 200 inch telescope at Mount Palomar in California. Right, so uh, when I first started reading about astronomy, I read that this was the biggest telescope in the world. 
And how big is it? I mean, you can see here, it has got a, it has got a primary mirror, which is 200 inches in diameter, and which is 5.1 meters. And 5.1 meters is quite a lot. It, it's from there to there, from the mall almost. And uh, you can imagine a mirror as large as that. It is not a linear, it is round. And so it becomes extremely large. And what you need to do is to put it in a superstructure so that you can point it very accurately at an object in the sky and to track it. So these are extremely giant telescopes. So I had, uh, when I first started reading about this telescope, I also read that you can't make a telescope bigger than this telescope. So typically in science or in technology, uh, you should you should never say never again. Okay, you must have seen a James Bond movie with that name. Because uh, if you say that you can't make it, then people make take it a challenge to make a bigger thing. Right? So why did people say that you can't make a uh, telescope bigger than this? Because you see that the mirror is very round. Now, if you turn it, the mirror will start sagging. And then it's okay. So what you do is that uh, in order to get clear uh, no, no. the mirror very quick so that it doesn't it doesn't it is not stressed even uh, it doesn't bend under the stress as you make it thicker it becomes heavy and the idea was that if you make it thicker than the Palomar mirror bigger than the Palomar mirror then it will simply crash under its own weight so that was the thing but then uh, Look at the next telescope. This is not moving. Well, oh, the battery is running now. You have to, you have to.
Okay. Projector. Yeah, okay. You know, move me over Message or not, you slide on the I'll come out there Okay, okay. All right. So you see that we you were at the Palomar five meter telescope, and now you look at these. A very beautiful picture of what is known as a very large telescope. There are four telescopes actually, and these are in very deep in South America in Chile, in the Andes Mountains, because the weather there is the best for observing astronomical observations. And then when you, uh, each of these, the, the diameter of the, these are four identical telescopes, and uh, the diameter of the mirror um, is actually close to eight meters, 8.2 meter diameter. So which is so much bigger uh, than the Palomar mirror. And then you can see uh, one of the a person standing there, and it gives you the scale of the mirror. So why, uh, how was this mirror possible? That is because of modern material. So this is a material which is known as a glass ceramic, okay? And then it is much lighter, and therefore it was possible to make a much thinner mirror uh, than the Palama mirror, and therefore the weight did not affect it, number one. Number two, the, the, effect, on the, the effect of the mirror is not zero, it is false. And therefore, something which is known as active optics is used so that you have got a lot of instruments below the mirror. And as the mirror gets distorted, these keep pushing and pulling the mirror so that the shape of the mirror maintains constant. And how often you have to do it? You have to do it about once every second. So many of these instruments have to work in tandem. So that is what is possible with modern technology. Right, so um, 
Now, uh, now can I make, I have, I made an eight meter mirror now. So can I make a 12 meter mirror? Can I make a 30 meter mirror like this? It turns out that it is extremely difficult because if you imagine grinding a mirror, which is as big as this pond. And if I make a mistake somewhere, uh, then the entire mirror becomes not usable. And you can use it only as a smaller mirror. And then uh, there are also other very great practical difficulties. Now look at this mirror here, how big it is. There's a VLT mirror. And then you make the mirror close to the telescope, but not at it, because you require very complex uh, instruments to make it. And then you have to put it on a truck, and then you have to transport it, because all the telescopes are at a very high altitude. They don't transport it all over. And you simply can't build big enough roads. So then how do you face it? Does it mean the end of the road that I can't make mirror, bigger mirrors? So astronomers uh, developed an extremely, uh, extremely clever idea, which is known as a segmented mirror telescopes. But the idea is that you break up the mirror into small parts. Okay, and then you maintain the shape electronically. So you see that uh, the, the best known segmented mirror telescope is what is a Keck telescope. So these are in California, and there are two Keck telescopes. So why do you make two telescopes and four telescopes? And that is because you want to combine them together. You want to combine them together and uh, light from them to run the interferometer. Okay, because that increases the resolution. So how do you do the segmented mirror? Now look at this thing here. This is a mirror, and the mirror is not round. The telescope mirror is not round. It is, and it is made up of a large number of segments. This has got a diameter of 10 meters. And you see that this red object that you see here, it is actually a person sitting there with outstretched arms. Okay, so you can see how big the mirror is. And uh, it consists of a large number of segments like this. So there are 36 hexagonal segments. And then uh, they are 1.8 diameter each. So uh, uh, until, until quite recently, uh, the biggest telescope, until some years ago, the biggest telescope in India had got a diameter of 2.2 meters. Okay, so uh, so you see that this is uh, uh, so this is uh, uh, this is not a very small telescope compared to that each one, but there are 36 like this, and uh, and behind each mirror uh, there is a component of active objects. Okay, which which acts once a second. Okay, and then keeps the telescope in line. Right, so. Uh, so you see, in addition to that, you need another great invention, which is known as adoptive optics. So what happens is that you take a star like the sun and you put it at a distance of five light years, okay, which is about the distance of the nearest star to us. The angular diameter of the sun will be practically zero. So when you when you photograph it, you should just get a dot on your CCD camera. But what do you get? You actually get a disk. Okay, so look at this. This is a star known as Betelgeuse, which is a, which is an extremely extended star, and it has been in an image of the star appears to be extended. So why does it appear to be extended? For the same reason that stars twinkle, because the atmosphere scatters the light coming from the star. So instead of getting a point image, you get an extended image, and you can see here uh, that uh, how the image is dancing around. We do take a very quick snapshot of it, very quick images, and uh, in order to uh, in order to reduce this broadening, which is always present, astronomers use a, a very fascinating technique, which is known as uh, adoptive optics. And when you use that, you see here, uh, here you see that there is a this is the image without adoptive optics, and you see how beautiful this image is. It is just a, the way the intensity goes. And how do you do that? So this is a simulation of uh, something without adoptive optics, and you see the same field with adoptive optics. And how do you do that? So you fire a laser beam from the ground to the atmosphere, and you create an artificial star there. You observe that star, you know what its real image, you compare the two, and you correct the mirror. And this is known as adoptive optics. And um, there's something uh, which is very interesting, and uh, you, you know that we are doing better and better in India now with technology. And one consequence of that, our, our improving our technology, is that for the 30 meter telescope, the 30 meter telescope has, I think, something like 500 segments in it. And about 150 of those segments are being polished in India. 
in a facility which has been set up uh, at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics in Bangalore. And then these are polished there. And not only that, the entire electronic, electromechanical equipment, which is very sensitive to keep the mirror in line, uh, in perfectly shaped is also being made in India. So it was, uh, it was designed in collaboration with the other partners in the telescope abroad. And then there are Indian industries which are making all the electronics. So that is a great progress. Now, what I want to do uh, after this is that we have got the VLT. So you'll say that we have built all this telescope, but what kind of observations do you make with this telescope? And can I cannot point to some specific observations. So I want to show you, I showed you Galileo's observations. And now I'll show you, to talk about a particular observation with a, <clears throat> with a VLT, which is very easy to understand, but which is a very profound consequence. And if I show you something highly technical, you'll not appreciate it. But look at, let's see something which has been done. And uh, this work uh, detected a supermassive object in the center of a galaxy, and it got the Nobel uh, Prize for Physics. Okay, so for uh, Reinhard Genzel, who led a group from Germany, which used the VLT, and Andrea Gess, who led a group, a completely independent work, a group from the USA, which used a Keck telescope to get exactly the same result. They shared the Nobel Prize. So you see that this one, some of you may recognize, is a picture of our Milky Way. Because our we live in a galaxy. The galaxy is not a Milky Way. And if you go far from a major city like Chandigarh, you can see, see the Milky Way, the band of the Milky Way in the sky, which Galileo first resolved into individual stars. So this is the disk of the Milky Way that you see in the sky. Then if you look at the constellation of Sagittarius, and you can, from Chandigarh, it will be very close to the horizon, actually, because it is in the south. So you will see the central region of the Milky Way. Okay, and the central region looks like this here. Okay, so that is a bulge of the galaxy. So this is a panoramic view of the galaxy. I mean, it is, a, it is taken from inside. When you point the camera at the belt of the Milky Way, and then you turn it, and you get an image of the galaxy, uh, like this, it's taken in infrared light. and uh, Radio astronomers had discovered that at the center of the galaxy, there is a source which is known as Sagittarius A. So this is the radio map of the galaxy. And at the center, there's a source which is known as Sagittarius A star. And that point is fixed. It doesn't move at all like the other stars in the galaxy. And it is generally taken to be the center of the galaxy. So uh, the two groups that I talked about, what they are what they wanted to do was to look at the stars which are in motion around that center of the galaxy. The difficulty is that <clears throat> these stars are about 25,000 light years away from us. So the stars will look very, very dim. Secondly, uh, these stars, there is a lot of dust in the galaxy which absorbs light from the stars. And therefore, the stars appear to be even dimmer. So how do you get over it? They use two things. One, use a very large telescope, number one. Number two, you carry out your observations at near infrared light. And why near infrared light? That is because you know, many of you will know, that as the wavelength increases, there's a wall upon lambda four law. Okay, which as the wavelength increases, the absorption decreases. So near infrared is the longest wavelength that astronomers can use with high resolution. So they use this, it is extremely difficult observation. And you see, the size of our galaxy from end to end is 100,000 light years. Okay, but what you have here, you can look at the square here, the size of that square is about a few light months. So you are taking a tiny portion of the galaxy and you see the stars there. And here, this is a zoomed thing around Sagittarius A star. And there's a particular star which is known as uh, uh, S2. And uh, what the astronomers did was that they followed the orbit of S2, meaning that all the stars in the galaxy are going around the center of the galaxy. And they looked at this particular star and they looked at its orbit. Okay, you see that. So this is Sagittarius A star, and this is just a pictorial representation. It's not a real image. And you can see that. The, the star is, go, is going in an orbit. And when the orbit was actually plotted, so this is a very simple experiment. Okay, you have got you have got a star, you're looking observing it, 
over a very long period of time, and then you're plotting the position of the star in the sky. Now, it seems to be very simple, but it's incredibly difficult because the observations were carried out over 20 years, and you need to define a coordinate system which is constant over those 20 years. Right, so, so then you see that the blue points here are, uh, the blue points are by one group and the red points are by other group. They perfectly agree with each other. And you see that the shape of the orbit is a nearly perfect ellipse. So who, who first made an observation like that? So it was in the 17th century, around the time of Galileo, made by Kepler. Then all of you might have heard about Kepler's laws. So how did he discover Kepler's law? By looking at the orbit of the planet Mars. And what was Kepler's law? That Mars is going around the sun in an elliptical orbit. So Kepler did it with naked eye observations carried out by Tycho Brahe. And his data was given to Kepler and Kepler analyzed it and found the elliptical orbit. And we have similarly found an elliptical orbit here. Right, so and then it's quite remarkable that Kepler could not say why the orbit is elliptical, but for that he had to, we had to wait for 100 years more until Newton was born. And Newton said that it is because of the gravitational effect of the sun uh, on the planet Mars. And then when you had this orbit here and the elliptical orbit, Newton also using his theory, one could determine what is the mass of the object here. So when we determine the mass of the object, uh, you find that it is actually uh, 4.2 into 10 to the 6 solar masses. It is 4 million times the mass of the sun. And that is the uh, that is the mass of the object. So it's a compact object. And one can prove that it's a very compact object. And therefore, there is every reason to believe that this particular object is a supermassive black hole. Right? But there are also other very nice observations. If you look at this red circle here, you find that the two ends of the ellipse are not uh, the, the two, two ends of the ellipse are not actually sitting on top of each other. There's a slight deviation there. And what is the deviation due to? It is because the ellipse is precessing. And that is exactly what was predicted by Albert Einstein. So these are, these are very remarkable observations which have been made and which more or less establishes the existence of a supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy. Okay. So after this, uh, I go to my, the, uh, the final part of my talk, so which will be observations from space. So which are the first great optical observatory in space that are known as the Hubble Space Telescope? Many of you would have heard about it because the HST images are going all over the place. And this was launched in 1990. That's quite a long time ago, 33 years ago. And they expected that the telescope will survive for 10 years, but it's going on for such a long time. And then uh, it has got a mirror with a diameter of only uh, uh, about 2 meters, 2.4 meters in diameter. So on the Earth, we have telescopes as big as 10 meters diameter. So why, why put such a, a small telescope in orbit? That is because when you go outside the atmosphere, the resolution is very, very great because there is no blurring due to the atmosphere. And therefore, you can make, you can object, you can see very faint objects. And then, uh, you see here, for example, there's an object which is known as the globular cluster. And there's a small little part of the globular cluster. And you see that these circles, inside every circle, there's a tiny object which is known as a white dwarf. So at one, at one time, like in the 20th century, when Chandrasekhar did his work, there were only three white dwarfs which are known. But now, a single thing like this observation shows you a multiplicity of white dwarfs. And another picture here, which is known as the Hubble Extreme Field. It is a very tiny field, but every little object that you see here uh, is a galaxy. Okay, so the galaxy contains 10 to the 11 stars. It contains 10 to the uh, 11 planets. And maybe uh, even with a small probability, every tiny dot here may have a million civilizations like us. Okay, so which tells you the scale uh, that we are observing uh, with the space telescope. So here is another field we observe with the space telescope. I'm just showing it to you because uh, a young student of mine long ago worked on this particular field. Uh, and then you see that this is again, there are here, uh, you, I ask you how many sources are there in this particular area? 
and you'll say maybe 200, maybe 500, but there are actually 59,000 sources there because they're too faint to be seen with the eye, the dots. And then if you look at this particular rectangle here, so you see that we are zooming onto that rectangle. The dots have all become galaxies, and you see the central dot is like that. Right? So this is there is so much information which is packed in a single image which is there. Right? So now I come to the last part, the James Webb telescope. Now you must all heard about the James Webb telescope because again, there's a lot of it on the internet. So it was launched uh, on the Christmas day uh, it, uh, two years ago. Right, so, so here you can see the telescope. It has got a very large mirror and the mirror is gold plated because you know, that just to optimize the efficiency of the mirror and it was sent out in space. That's a very large object. And even the biggest object, it will be impossible to launch it just like that, open. So what you'll do uh, is amazing technology. And you see that the weight of the mirror is 6.1 tons. And then uh, uh, the diameter, uh, you see the, the weight to primary mirror is 6.5 meters in diameter. The space telescope at 2.5 is a 6.5. And then, uh, so you see that the sequence of events. So it was launched on Christmas day from the earth. It has to go to the second Lagrangian point, which is L2. And then, then you see that it was launched like this, folded. Then it starts opening out. And, uh, and then you see that here it is completely unfurled. And this process took 9.1 days. Right, so now every one of them, every step is incredibly complex. The cost of this uh, telescope is $8 billion. Okay, and then if it doesn't open, then you're finished. $8 billion gone down the drain. When it happened, then it has to go very far. The second Lagrangian point, 1.5 million kilometers away between the Earth and the Sun. And then it sits there at the Lagrangian point. You see, uh, our, uh, our Aditya is going to go to L1 because it has to point toward the sun. So this telescope has got to point away from the sun. So it goes to L2. Right, so, uh, so now you see here, and some of the thing is blocking, and I is blocking some important part. Yeah. So, so you see here, uh, uh, you see here that this is one side of the telescope and the other side of the telescope. Here is a mirror. And the difference between them, the hot side, the side which faces the sun, is at 85 degrees Celsius. The side which faces away from the sun is at minus 233 degrees Celsius. Right? So which means that you see how much, how good the insulation has to be. All kinds of extreme technology is there. Right? So... Uh, so now it has got, this is a near infrared imager because I told you near infrared is the most efficient one for observing. And now I show you some pictures of taken with the, with the James Webb telescope. And also I will show you uh, some very important, very simple, but very important results which have been obtained from it. Okay, so look at this beautiful image. These are clouds in our own galaxy, in clouds of interstellar dust. And here they are taken at different wavelengths with the telescope, right? So, uh, and then, uh, so from this kind of images, you can get a lot of information. But to see uh, what is the improvement, here is the same image taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. That you see how much more resolution we have now. And here is another image, which is taken, which is a pair of galaxies, which are interacting with each other and which are at a distance of 500 million light years from us. And uh, the same pair taken with the Hubble Space Telescope and taken from the ground. So you see that how this technology, it costs $8 billion, but it is going to give you so much more insight into what you have, uh, uh, what is happening in galaxies. Now, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to show you three cases, very quickly, three cases of important results which have been obtained. That the one case, I've been showing you nice pictures of galaxies, but you may not believe it, but this is also a galaxy. Except that uh, it is a most distant galaxy which is known at the present. At the present meaning what? A few weeks ago. And you have to be very careful because in a few weeks time, things can change in two different ways. They can discover a galaxy which is slightly more distant, or somebody will come and prove that this distance measurement was not correct. 
So because the people who want to say it is most distant want to push it. And the other people want to show that right? so that is how science goes. There's a lot of competition which is there. But let us take it as the most distant object. And where is it? You see, you must understand one thing clearly that when an object is very distant, light takes a long time to come from there to us. So when we are 30.6 billion light years away, how much time has light taken to reach us? So it is 13.6 billion years. Then that is the definition of a light year. And what is the age of the universe? The age of the universe is also 13.6 billion years. So which means that this particular galaxy you're observing is just a few hundred million years after the creation of the universe in the Big Bang. Now here, you have to believe all this picture because there are doubts about everything. But if you believe that there's a Big Bang, then this galaxy was created just a few hundred billion years after the Big Bang. And then the light has been traveling for 13.6 billion years reach. And what is the great surprise? The great surprise is that this galaxy is bigger than anticipated and it has more stars being formed than anticipated. Right? Because you don't expect that so early in the life of the universe, it is like this. So it, it is, you sometimes hear about uh, prodigies, right? So they are very young. And somebody becomes a chess grandmaster at the age of 11. But this is like becoming a chess grandmaster, but maybe at the age of 0 0.001 seconds or something like that. So, but so it is, uh, uh, so it's a very far off, but very well formed. Then, uh, so this galaxy, uh, again, is 430 million years out of the Big Bang. And that is also doing things which it is not supposed to be doing. And here is a group of galaxies. Right, it's a, it's a group of several galaxies, all at the same distance. So it is what is called a galaxy cluster. And it is a cluster which is just forming. Okay, it's like, you know, oof. I mean, a, a baby just starts getting formed. It's just forming. And what will happen to it later? So you see that, you see this is known as a coma cluster. And it has got two large galaxies in the central region. And it has got a total of about 1,000 galaxies. Right, so this... This uh, primordial cluster that we are seeing is going to develop into something like the Kova cluster over billions of years. Now, we will not be around to see at that time. And uh, the astronomers at that time may be able to see it, but whether people remain in astronomy billions of years from now is not clear. Because, the, in fact, the expected a lifetime of the sun is another 4.5 billion years. I mean, after that, the sun explodes and everything will be gone. Okay, now. I had taken you very close to the universe, uh, to the beginning of the universe. And here now we are coming closer. And these are objects within our own galaxy. Some of you may know that until 1995, uh, there were no planets known outside our own galaxy, uh, our own solar system. Then astronomers began to understand, find them because of the development in technology. And now we have to know thousands and thousands of exoplanets. Now these exoplanets, the idea is that these planetary systems which you have discovered are utterly and completely different from our own planetary system. Okay, one of the reasons is that our own planetary system, you would not be able to observe it if it were very far away. You need to observe a planetary system where the planets are very large and very close to the star because you observe them because of the perturbation of the planet on the star. Right, so, uh, so now uh, this is a planet which is known as Was. This is just an artist's impression. You don't get images like this. And then here is the star around which the planet is orbiting. And the beauty is that you can observe the planet which is moving across the star. Now you must understand that this is not a resolved image. Okay? It's not resolved. So you're just observing the star. And suddenly you find that the light from the star has dipped like this and goes away. And so why is it why is it dipping? For the same reason that the sun gets dimmed by the moon, by the shadow of the moon. So the shadow of the planet is dimming the star. You can't see it moving, but you know that this is a time it has taken to transit the star. Then another beautiful thing. Now this planet has got an atmosphere. So when the planet is going across the face of the star, light coming from the star passes through the atmosphere and that light is absorbed. So you get an absorption spectrum, but you're not resolving it. So you take the spectrum from the star when it is not 
when the planet is not there, and then take the spectrum during the transit and subtract one from the other, and you get a spectrum, you get a spectrum of the atmosphere. Okay, and then these, these measurements are extremely accurate. So I should tell you, for example, that you can measure the velocity of the planet with an accuracy of one meter per second uh, these days. Right, so, so you see that this beautiful spectrum that you see, it is actually the spectrum of the planet. And you will not be able to read it. The point is that I, I, I just don't understand these things because uh, I thought that chemistry for a long time. But you see that there is water here. Water means there could be life. And other very interesting thing and, uh, is that there is sulfur dioxide. So you said that what, what is so exciting about sulfur dioxide? Water you can understand. But why sulfur dioxide? The point is that sulfur dioxide generally cannot be found created in the planet at the distance that it is from the star. So which means that the planet probably was created far away and then it had drifted. So this gives you more and more insight into how our own solar system was. Okay, and uh, look at this one here, uh, this planet, and this is a very, very recent observation. And there is this uh, planet, this star, again, this artist's conception. And when you look at this, uh, uh, when you look at the spectrum, and when was this spectrum released? Just four days ago, September 11th. And uh, there's a person called Niku Madhusudan at, in Cambridge, in the Institute of Astronomy. And he's a leading, he's a very young guy. He's a leading scientist on this. And uh, then he has been studying planetary atmospheres theoretically for a very long time. And what do you find here? You find methane, you find carbon dioxide, and you're not finding ammonia. No, for me, this is just Greek and Latin. Okay, so I don't know what it means, but for the experts, what it means, and I tried to read it quickly, I could not, so I'm going to do that on my way back to Pune. Uh, what it means is that this particular planet, it's called, uh, it's a, it's, it's a called a sub neptune planet. Okay, meaning that it is, it's, Neptune is four times bigger than the Earth, and this is less than, smaller than Neptune. And you take into account the size, and the atmosphere is rich in hydrogen, and it means that there must be water, there must be oceans on the surface of the planet. And that is what leads to this composition. And then another very fascinating thing, the fact is that here, that there is something called uh, dimethyl sulfide, which is CH3, two molecules of CH3, and two, uh, two combinations of CH3, and then there is sulfur there. And apparently, dimethyl sulfide, which is found in our atmosphere, can only be produced by plankton. You know, plankton is a small microorganism, which whales eat, the small organisms. They are in the ocean. So, which means that, as far as we know on the Earth, dimethyl sulfide can only be produced by living forms. So, we should mean that this is probably the first detection of living forms outside our planet. And so, so you see that the simple things, chemistry, methane, no ammonia, but it leads to such fabulous conclusions. The last one, a comet. I mean, you couldn't be closer to it because I talked of extraterrestrial planets, but they're within our solar system. They've got a comet. So this is known as the hell bomb. And it has got, it appeared in 1997. You can't read it here. And, uh, and then uh, when will it come next? It'll come 2,500 years later. So it's quite much in the future. So uh, now where do comets come from? So you see that these are our planetary systems. This is not to scale. These are planetary systems. Our distance from the sun is one astronomical unit, which was 150 million kilometers. And uh, this uh, Saturn is at 10 astronomical units. And there is a thing here called the Oort cloud, which is at 1 million astronomical units. We only infer that there is a cloud. It has not been actually uh, observed directly yet. And uh, this cloud, and it is believed that this Oort cloud, no, it is not at 1 million, it is at 10,000 astronomical units, 10,000 to 100,000 astronomical units. And the Oort cloud uh, is believed is a house of many comets. Any comet, which has got a period more than 200 years, uh, comes from the wood cloud. And then uh, there's another belt between the observation of, between the orbit of Uranus, Neptune, just beyond the orbit of Neptune, and that is called the Kuiper belt. And 
low period comets come from there. So these comets, uh, you see that uh, these comets have ice, water ice, and other kinds of ices on it. When they come close to the sun, the the bombardment of charged particles from the sun, energetic particles from the sun, and the, and the, the radiation also uh, evaporates these things and it forms a corona. And under certain, certain conditions, these tails are formed. Now, these are all standard comets, but there are non standard comets. And these non standard comets come from the, there's a belt between the orbit of Mars and Jupiter, there's a belt of what are the, and it is the belt of asteroids. You must have heard of asteroids. They're small rocky bodies, and there are millions of them. We have seen thousands of them. And they, uh, there are some comets which come from there, and they are called the main belt comets. Okay, and here is a beautiful observation of a main belt comet uh, by JWST. And you see that, what do you see here? You see water. I mean, this particular emission line, the line that you see here, is because of water. So and this is extremely surprising. So why is it surprising? Because we have seen water is there on so many planets and so on. And that is because you see that the uh, the comets in the Kuiper belt and the wood cloud are very far away. So the sun cannot evaporate the ice which is present. And the ice gets evaporated only when they come close to the sun. Right? And you see the beautiful tail. But here, this comet comes from close to the sun because it is a it's a it's a main belt comet. And therefore it should not have ice. Okay, but uh, but it has ice because when it comes close by, you see the tail. So which again which has a lot of implications for the way the, our planets are formed and why there is water on the planets in the solar system, why on Earth, but no planet on Mars. It has got a lot of implications for the creation of these planets. So you see that my aim has been for you to first tell you about the technology of the telescope and then to explain to you some very, very simple observations which are very profound consequences. And that is the way astronomy has developed from the time of Galileo to the James Webb Space Telescope. Thank you very much. अगर आप में से कोई क्वेश्चन स्पेस से रिलेटेड कोई भी प्रश्न आपको वो प्रश्न भी नहीं लग रहा हो वो भी प्रश्न पूछ सकते हैं तो लैंग्वेज डजंट मैटर आप हिंदी में भी पूछ सकते हो मराठी कन्नड़ आप क्योंकि सर हमने आपके आने से पहले बच्चों को ये बताया था कि स्पेस से रिलेटेड कोई भी प्रश्न आपके दिमाग में हो और जो प्रश्न भी नहीं लग रहा है कि जैसे मैंने इनको एक वैसे एग्जांपल दिया था कि हमने चार लोग स्पेस में भेजे एक बीमार हो गया तो उस ना तो हम मिशन को वापस ला सकते हैं ना हम वहां पे उनको वैसे छोड़ सकते हैं तो वो भी तुम्हारे दिमाग में कोई भी प्रश्न हो जो आपको प्रश्न नहीं लग रहा हो वो सारे प्रश्नों के उत्तर आपको मिल जाएंगे बच्चों ये वहां पर एक प्रश्न है Good afternoon, sir. So, thank you very much for the session. So, my question is related to adaptive optics. Sir, I didn't understand it. Okay, now uh, it is a, as I told you, let me explain that to you again because it's a very, very important technology and that's the kind of technology that you people will be studying in the future. So, uh, first of all, you see that stars are twinkling, planets don't twinkle, but stars twinkle. Why do they twinkle? Because there's a ray of light coming from the distant star and entering the lens of your eye. But uh, as time passes, meaning that in, in a fraction of a second, the, the density of the atmosphere can change because there's a lot of movement in the atmosphere. So the refractive index changes. When the refractive index changes, what happens, tell me? The ray is deviated. So the ray goes out of your eye, comes into the eye. Out of your eye, comes into the eye. 
and that is why you see the trick key. So I remove my eye and I put a CCD uh, camera there. And what will happen? It is being hit here, hit here, hit there, hit there, hit there. And so what the image will be? The image will spread out. Right? So now supposing you're observing a binary star, meaning the two stars are very close to each other. And then each star is spread out. Then the binary will appear as a single star. So you are lost information. So I would like to improve the resolution. So you know that the resolving power of a telescope is lambda by D. So how do you improve the resolution? Either by decreasing the wavelength, which is not always practical, or increasing the telescope diameter, which is very expensive. So therefore you want other techniques. And this technique is called adoptive optics. So what you do is that you take a laser beam and shoot it at the atmosphere. When it hits the atmosphere, you will get a, a small image there. You pretend it's a star. And when you observe that image, that image will be spread out, right? Because it's traveling through the atmosphere. But you know what is the real shape of the image. Because you know what is the real shape of the laser beam. Because you have made that laser beam, right? So, so you've got the observed shape and you've got the real shape. Now what you do is very wonderful. In the telescope, you've got a primary mirror, but you've got a whole series of mirrors for focusing and so on. Okay, and to divert the light. One of those mirrors is made flexible. So you are observing, you are doing the observation 1000 times a second. Every millisecond you're getting an observation. And then you are comparing the big image with the small image. And then you're sending that information to the flexible mirror. And that mirror changes its shape. So you understand it in a different way. It's, it's very nice. That's why I'm making so long good answer. You know that uh, from a point, how does light spread? It spreads out as a sphere. Right? You've got concentric sphere. There's a distance. I'm seeing the sphere. When it comes to me, because the star is so far away, it's a plane wave. Right? But because of the distortion of the atmosphere, the plane wave becomes curved. So I am adjusting the curvature of the mirror to reflect that curvature. So therefore, it is like observe, observing the curved wave surface with the curved mirror is the same as observing the plane wave surface of the So therefore, you increase the resolution. You get that? It's clearly very difficult technology. And in all the telescopes so far, it is, <clears throat> it is put on as an added instrument. Whereas the new telescopes which are being built is an integral part. I recently heard one young lady give a talk on that. I mean, she was in our institute long ago, when she was much younger. Even now she's quite young. And then she gave such a beautiful talk on these adoptive optics. I said that if I can understand it so well, I'd be so happy. Yes, please. Um, uh, Sir, my question is that you have calculate the sunset for one astronomical unit. Sir, you can calculate the sunset. What do you mean? What do you mean? Sir, you have to say that one astronomical unit. Sir, you can measure the sunset. Okay. Now, you see that for the sunset, बहुत तरीके हैं मैं और भी एक डिफिकल्ट मेजरमेंट बताता हूं आपको कि सब जो एक दूर वाला स्टार है मैंने कहा आपको कि जो स्टार अब तक क्लोजेस्ट स्टार जो है वो 5 लाख लाइट इयर्स दूर है कैसे मेजर करो तो ऐसे करते हैं कि सब जो कि आज मैंने आज 15 सितंबर है तो आज मैंने स्टार का ऑब्जर्वेशन किया तो टेलीस्कोप पर पॉइंट करूंगा और बैकग्राउंड है और वो स्टार का पोजीशन मैं डिटरमिन कर छह महीने के बाद यानी मार्च में 15 मार्च को मैं डायमीट्रिकली ऑपोजिट पॉइंट पर होगा अपने ऑर्बिट में तो फिर मैं उसका पोजीशन तो पोजीशन अलग क्योंकि बैकग्राउंड चेंज हो जाता है तो पहले यहां से दिखता हूं तो वहां से दिखता हूं तो ट्रायंगल मिल गया इस ट्रायंगल में आपको ऊपर का एंगल पता है और बेस पता है तो आप ट्रायंगुलेशन से डिस्टेंस कितना है वो Good afternoon, sir. I'm sure. 
So my question is, what is supernova? How it is formed? And after how many years it will happen again? Yes. So <clears throat> there's one supernova going off in our galaxy about once every year. Okay, so there are there are so many galaxies that there are many supernovae going on. So why? How is a supernova form? When a, a star with a mass of more than about eight times the mass of the sun, when it completes its evolution, the inner part collapses. Okay, because uh, when it completes its evolution, there's no fuel left, so the inner part becomes cold, and then it can't withstand the gravitational pull. It collapses. That releases a lot of energy, which blows out the rest of the star. The part which has collapsed, it becomes either a neutron star or a black hole. And the part which is which is ejected very forcefully, that event is called supernova. And then if you see the gas, it can be it can be observed at all wavelengths. And that that expanding gas is known as a supernova remnant. And that is what you can picture. So you can say a supernova is formed as an end state of massive stars. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for the beautiful explanation of all the questions. So my question is, uh, how do massive black holes grow? How do massive black holes grow? Yes, they they grow by eating matter. Okay, you see, what happens is that I, I told you that there's a massive black hole uh, at the center of our galaxy. So why does it absorb everything immediately? That is because things are in orbit. So just like the Earth is not absorbed by the sun because it is going in the orbit around us. So similarly, but in, in spite of that, there are these stars which keep <coughs> which uh, keep falling onto the black hole. So just imagine that I told you that the that the mass of the black hole uh, is uh, 10 to the 6 solar masses, right? So if it swallows a star like the sun one per year, then its mass will increase by that much. So in 10 to the 10 years, uh, the mass will become 10 to the 10 solar masses. So, the, so they eat the surrounding stars and surrounding gas, and then they grow in size. So I have another question. How long can a human in outer space last without a spaceship before exploding? Without a? Without a spacesuit. Without a spacesuit. Space yeah. You tell me, how long can you last in water if you are dragged inside the water without an oxygen mask, how long can it last? It's just a few minutes. That's because within a few minutes, your body gives up. It's exactly the same answer. Okay, but then there can be other problems also because it is extremely cold, extremely thing. Like when you're put when you're put in freezing water, if you fall into the water in the, in the Arctic or Antarctic oceans, then you are in deep trouble. So it is like that in space. Thank you, sir. So you alluded to the temperature difference on the side of the James Webb telescope facing the sun. Yes. So can you tell uh, the explanation for the same? Oh, that is because when you face the sun, how do we get energy of the earth? That's because it comes from the sun. So here it is facing the sun. You stand outside, if I go outside, within about one second I start sweating. Right? Because it's so hot, it's so hot, it's 34 degrees outside. So you are facing it, you have to, uh, and then they're more or less at the same distance as from the earth, only 1.5 million kilometers. And uh, that's why it gets getting heat. Okay, so you have to, whether the near infrared cameras can only operate at very low temperatures. So you need to provide uh, a mechanism by which you freeze oneself. And how do we achieve that much insulation? It, it, is, uh, it is insulation plus there are active ways of doing it. Because you're taking energy, there are large solar panels, you're taking energy from the solar panels and then you're using it like a refrigerant. It's okay. a bit, okay? Sir, I would like to know the contributions of Indian astronomers who are doing work in uh, Pune's uh, radio telescope as well as in Ladakh. Uh, yes, so, so uh, yeah. those are quite popular to science. For yes. The so, so you see that the as it was mentioned, the GMRT Giant Medium Medium Radio Telescope that was built by Professor Goen Soru, who, who passed away a couple of years ago. He built a series of radio telescopes in India, and uh, <clears throat> he built that telescope. 
it it consists of uh, about 30 antennas, each one of which is 45 meters in diameter. Okay, and uh, the antennas are built using extremely nice technology so that the weight doesn't become very high. And then you know, all these antennas spread over 30 kilometers. Then they, they can point, all of them can point to the one object and track it. Okay, and so you get very high resolution radio images at relatively lower wavelengths. And then over the last five years, there's an advanced version of that which has been built. So it is it is the most sensitive radio telescope which operates at relatively low frequencies. And then it is also, it, has, it is used by the entire world. So 50% of the time uh, approximately goes to Indian astronomers, 50% all over the world. But there's no rational, meaning that every, even a person from the GMRT Institute, which is called the National Center for Radio Astrophysics, it belongs to the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Every person has to compete for that. Then the telescope in Ladakh, uh, so that's a two meter telescope. So a two meter telescope is not very big, but the point is that it is at an excellent site. It's, a, it's in a place called Lake, uh, it's called Hang Lake, uh, which is presently about four hours of Jeep ride from Lake. It's a very high altitude. So you can do near infrared observations. And that has also been very successful. But the GMRT is really giant. And the Ladakh telescope is small. Yeah. And this is a deep question I have a is uh, and, uh, and habit of reading a lot of technology. And so, very really recently, I think two or three days ago, I read this article from the Sun. So, it's a newspaper. It says, Lost Earth like planet may be hiding inside our solar system as astrophysicists watch spinning movements they are coming. Yes. So uh, actually, this is a sec oh, yeah. so this is the second time I'm being asked this question in three days, and I my answer was that yes, I I I read about I just read the headline, but I didn't read what was inside because I've been traveling all the time. So you see that uh, how do you find new planets? Is that uh, Uranus was found completely accidentally? Okay, meaning that uh, what is the name of the astronomer? I'll tell you in a moment. German origin, but working in England for a long time. And so he discovered it. Whereas the, the planet which came subsequently, we discovered Neptune because of the perturbation that it exerts on the planet Uranus. And then you predict, you see that Uranus is not moving as it is supposed to be moving. And then you conclude that there must be other planet outside and you predict where it will. And Pluto also has discovered that. Okay, but uh, so... Now they would be looking at the effect of all the eight planets and Pluto and other objects like that. And then they would have, then you make a prediction saying that it's there. But this is probably not yet confirmed. Can this be the last question? Thank you so much. Thank you so much sir, for this uh, lecture. Uh, my question is like a uh, statement about uh, the integrity and you know the the work which has been done with the hadron collider. Uh, we know that like uh, uh, the you know the Hubble Space uh, Space Telescope and uh, how James Webb has been using uh, its uh, properties to you know uh, trace back our uh, existence like from the Big Bang. I believe, uh, I know it might sound very foolish to say, but uh, if the Hadron Collider, what, uh, what we are experimenting, it's just a rhetor uh, rhetorical statement, but if we succeed in that, uh, don't you think we would uh, like create a black hole inside of that uh, collider? And we might also be that. So you see that uh, those black holes are created, they are not, they are not uh, a million times more massive than the sun, right? So there are many black holes. And as I told you, if you create a mini black hole of just 10 to the 15 grams, 10 to the 12 grams, so that's the, that's the kind of black holes which Stephen Hawking was talking about. This will not even be like that. So it will be, I mean, because you're creating with elementary particles. So what do you mean by that kind of a black hole is not known. And they're extremely likely, unlikely to fall in it at that. Thank you very much. It was a great, enjoyable experience. Thank you. Thank you.